Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and our study of the church at Thyatira from Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. In this two-part study, we will look at the Jezebel that taught that immorality was acceptable and you could still call yourself a Christian. We will see that God promises that all such false professors in the church will go into the Great Tribulation. And we will see that the God of the Bible kills, which is very unlike the false gods of modern religion. These messages are available online at our website, kjvbiblebelievers.com. Stay tuned at the end and we will give additional contact information. But that website again is kjvbiblebelievers.com. We will now begin part one of this two-part study from Revelation chapter 2 verses 18 through 29, the church at Thyatira. As I said in chapter 2, we're closing the chapter, but this is the fourth of the seven churches. So chapter 3, we'll look at the final three um, churches that were mentioned uh, in chapter 1, the seven churches of Asia. And this one is called Thyatira. That's if you didn't know how to pronounce that. Thyatira. And we'll begin in uh, verse 18 where it says, And unto the angel of the church of, or in, Thyatira, write. Now, I mentioned the angel of the church. I told you that um, there's debate over whether this is like a real angel that God um, puts over each church or if these are the pastors. I personally believe it's the angels. And uh, we've talked about how there are angels who are over prince- principalities and powers, and that includes governments, that includes like Persia and Grecia that we saw in the book of Daniel. God's got plenty of angels. <laughs> And they can do everything uh, that He wants them to do. And sometime we're going to do a study just on the angels and uh, what the Scripture says. It's, it's fascinating. But it says, These things saith the Son of God, capital S, capital G, Son of God, referring to Jesus, who hath His eyes like unto a flame of fire, and His feet are like fine brass. And you remember we said that Jesus is no longer... The well, we we kind of take for granted that he had brown or black hair and a brown or black beard, and he was. uh, There's pictures of him people have painted, which I think are totally erroneous. Um, They they have this pale skinned blue eyed dude that I'm sure doesn't even resemble what Jesus looked like on this earth. He was probably dark skinned, um, being olive skinned Jew plus being in the sun. He probably looked kind of rough in, the, in his 30s, being a carpenter, walking everywhere the way he did in the sun, all that. But no matter what he looked like when he was on earth, he looks different now. <laughs> now he's glorified. And we saw his hair is white like wool. And here it says that his eyes are like unto a flaming or flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass. And I think it's just a healthy thing to get that through your mind that when you talk about Jesus and you think about Him now, don't allow this idle image of this Kenny Loggins look-alike that you see in all these paintings and pictures to pop in your head because that's not what He looks like. And that's one of the reasons I think we know that a lot of these so-called visitations are false because they always describe Him in the wrong way. If they were going to describe Him accurately, He should resemble what John says He looks like. John was the last one to see him. Amen? (laughs) So, um, as a way of background, how many of you ever heard of Thyatira before? Well, if you read through Revelation, obviously you should have, but um, Thyatira is still around. It's just by a different name. We'll talk about that in a second. But it's uh, in Asia, what we call Asia Minor, um, a road uh, along the Lycus River, uh, it's between Pergamos and Sardis. We'll look at the uh, map in a minute. But it, the name Thyatiris means odor of affliction. That's what the, the word means, odor of affliction. And uh, if you look on the map, uh, this is the map we've been using from week to week, so you can just see they're all kind of clumped together there 
right along the um, Aegean Sea where Patmos, the island where John was uh, banished for a time. And uh, then after, or while on Patmos, he gets this book that we're reading, the book of Revelation. So that's something to keep in mind, is always to remember, is the Bible is not a fairy tale. The Bible is written about real people in real places. You can go on a map and find it. You can jump on a plane and visit it. And uh, by the way, for 200 years in colleges and seminaries, they have been robbing people of their faith by saying, well, there's no archaeological evidence for there even being a King David, or there's no archaeological evidence for this or that. And uh, year after year, they keep discovering the archaeological evidence for these things. They found uh, inscriptions of David and Solomon. They used to say the kingdom of Assyria was, a, was a fictional. That Assyria, A-S-S-Y-R-I, never existed. And then they found uh, Nineveh. <laughs> And they started unearthing all these cities of Assyria, and uh, that keep that in mind. You're, I, you know, I love. I, I used to read more fiction, but you know, you read these fictional stories and fictional tales where they make up their own cities and their own countries and their own kings and all that. The Bible is real. It's real people, real history. Now, Thyatira is known for its dye guilds. Um, and it's famous for its indigo dyes. That little spot there is an example of the, what indigo looks like. It's the color um, used for blue jeans. And that's what one of the things that Thyatira is most famous for. How many of you remember uh, reading through Acts? Lydia, mm -hmm. she was a seller of purple. And so they were known for that. And she was exporting this dye uh, trade from Thyatira. She, is, she was near Philippi at the time that we read about her in the, the book of Acts. And Noah Hutchings pointed out, uh, he said, quote, it is interesting that much of the finest leather goods sold in America comes from um, Ikazar, which is the present day name for Thyatira. Um, expensive Turkish carpets are also made in this area by hand on looms that are hundreds of years old. You can actually fly over to Thyatira and observe these people making these carpets on these looms that are hundreds of years old. They're still doing it the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. But Jesus there is called the Son of God and the description, remember, just to give you the footnote, is what we read about in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. So you, you can see that there, he's repeating something that we all saw, and that is the real Jesus. That's the real Jesus. Because there are false Jesuses. There are false Christs. You've got to get the real one. Coke stole that. <laughs> but Jesus is the real thing, baby. Amen. So read verse 19 now, what he says to Thyatira. He says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. And the last to be more than the first. That's interesting. That's not a mistake. Go back, read your uh, Greek text. It says the same word in both places for works. And it's just a, a play on words to say that they, they, he knows their works and then these other things, and he comes back and says, and your works to be more, he says, the last to be more than the first. Meaning that after all said and done, they haven't slacked off one bit. They've served, they've served, it, well, he uses the word service, charity, meaning that they're not doing it for personal gain, they're doing it as ministers for others. They're doing it in faith. We can do, you know, you can do good works and they're of no use... You can do good works, and if it's not of faith, if you're doing it because you think you're earning something from God, or you're doing it because you think you're going to score points, or, you know, or, or you're going to get something from it, well, you better get something from it in here now, because in God's eyes, He will not reward that. But they were serving. They were charitable. They were doing it out of faith. They did it with patience, and uh, they were a, a very busy and fruitful uh, 
church. Now that's kind of a checklist that you and I can use the Bible as a mirror. We can look at that list and we can say, are we working? We sing that song, we'll work till Jesus comes. Well, we sing that because I hope we all mean it. We need to be busy about the Lord's work. Charity, are we doing it because we want to serve others and we love others? Um, are we doing it with the attitude of service, which means servanthood? Jesus Himself said that He came to minister to others and not to be ministered unto. And that's to be our attitude. While we're here, we should have the attitude we want to minister. We're not here to be served. We are here for service. Faith. That means that's not blind faith. That's not leaping off of tall buildings and hoping you land on your feet. That is faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance. And the evidence of things not seen. You see, it's not blind faith. Christianity is not just blind faith. I uh, became a Christian in spite of my desires. I did not want to be a Christian. I set out to basically refute and, and, and uh, be able to, I, I wanted to be able to look at these Christians who were talking to me and just say, you know, it's a load of bull. I believed in the evolutionary theory and I didn't believe the Bible and I believed what I was told about the Bible that's full of contradictions and errors and all that. But as I tested the Scripture, I found out all these archaeological facts. I found the historical documentation. I found that if you're going to believe in Plato and Socrates and not believe the Bible, you're a hypocrite. Because there is very little historical evidence. Socrates may not even have existed. And yet they teach it like it's just real. It's fact. Plato, we're pretty sure, did. But there's nowhere near the evidence to support Plato. Uh, they'll teach the writings of Herodotus. There's hardly any evidence. And the uh, documentary evidence is separated by a thousand years. We don't even know if what we have even compares to what Herodotus wrote. But you know what? We have fragments of the New Testament that are within the lifetime of the apostles, proving that our Bible matches what they had in 100 A.D. That blew my mind. You see, I became a Christian because of the substance and the evidence. I, didn't, I wasn't willing to take that blind leap. And I've heard people really applaud that blind faith, and you shouldn't. God never asks us to make that kind of a blind leap. God says, here is my word, and He says, prove all things. He says to try the spirits. So we're not supposed to just be blindly accepting whatever we're told. And that's one of the things he's saying here about Thyatira. And of course, patience is something that uh, we'll be working on until we get there. Amen. So they worked as much now as they did at first. Remember, Ephesus had lost their first love. Mm -hmm. And he said, go back and do the first works. <laughs> he's basically saying, get back there to where you started and start all over. And uh, they, had, they had endured, and uh, it's a, it was a good local church. It would come highly recommended if you were looking for a church and you lived in Asia Minor. But, <laughs> verse 20, read that with me. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Well, you see, that's what's going on today. Um, and some of the people who are teaching this stuff are uh, female uh, teachers, just like Jezebel. But it's going on among the male and the female teachers uh, today who they are claiming to be something that they're not, for starters. Um, prophetess. Uh, there are actual people claiming that they are prophets and prophetesses today. And they're not. As I said, you prove all things. You try the spirits. These people don't prophesy. And what they do is more like 
psych, uh, uh, psychic phenomena, not really prophecy. And they walk up to you and they try, like they're reading your aura and do all this stuff. Well, that's the occult. That's not what God does. That's not the Holy Spirit. And they never really prophesy, and they, but some of them try. <laughs> they get a little cocky. I think, you know, they get to riding around in those jet airplanes and wearing those $3,000 suits. As they say, you ever heard this phrase? They start to believe their press. <laughs> yeah. And so then the next thing you know, they're actually trying to prophesy. They get it wrong. And you could go, you know, uh, Paul Crouch, Benny Hinn, uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland, all these guys that are well-known claiming to have the gift of prophecy and all that. They have prophesied. Uh, Oral Roberts, who's died a few years ago, he prophesied. They all got their prophecies wrong. So what are you supposed to do? Turn them off. But people lack common sense, and they won't turn them off. And they keep sending the money and sending the checks. Well, there's nothing we can do about that, but we can ourselves not fall for that. And Jeze Jezebel is an example of those who teach and seduce my servants, seducing Christians to commit fornication. And uh, I wanted to point out that these guys are always self-appointed prophets. Do you realize in the Bible there was always a confirmation from God for His prophets? No one just stood up one day and said, I'm a prophet, follow me. <laughs> you know, just because you can afford to get an attorney and set up a 5013C and and get a camera and you know a lot of these guys who get on TV they they make money in the business world first and then they use that money to get themselves on television and then the next thing you know they're prophesying or claiming to be a prophet or whatever self-appointed and uh, we need to be aware of them they they will lead you astray if you fall for that Now I highlighted there those phrases to commit fornication to eat things sacrificed into idols those are the two things God is dealing with Thyatira on but on a flip them on their head and first mention that last phrase, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And we mentioned this before once already. Um, this was done in spite of the commandment in Romans chapter 14 that we studied a few months ago in, in our study of Romans 14. That we're not to do things that will cause weak brothers to stumble or unbelievers to stumble. In other words, you know, you and I, we don't live around a place where they're sacrificing meat to idols. <laughs> So we don't really have to worry about that kind of thing. But there are still people who live in areas that are very uh, pagan and they still offer their meat as a sacrifice to their idol. And then they go out in the market and they sell it. Now, Paul was saying, you know, I just buy the meat and eat it, you know. But if this guy over here is watching Paul and he's getting off you know, upset about the fact that Paul's buying a piece of meat that was offered to Aphrodite, then Paul would not buy that piece of meat. And he'd buy something else. Or if they thought, you know, he's eating meat that was offered, he would just push the plate away and not eat it. Why? Because it, your liberty is not the most important thing. I mean, we have liberty, but our liberty is not the most important thing. The most important thing is our attitude of service and charity and love towards others. So if we're doing something that we know is going to offend, we shouldn't do it. And Jezebel was teaching them to ignore that. She was also teaching them to commit fornication. Now, I have a question here. What cult does not include a promiscuous cult leader involving his flock in sexual sin? I will tell you it is rare. You take any of the cults that exist today or have been around for decades or centuries, and it's rare that the cult leader was not a sex pervert who started his religion because he wanted to personally benefit from it, and one of the benefits was sex. Here's a, just a sampling of the list. I don't know how many of you knew this, but Muhammad started his religion and suddenly began to get visions from this 700-winged angel, which the Bible never you know, talks about existing, um, named Gabriel. Gabriel in the Bible didn't have 700 wings. But Muhammad would have these seizures and he'd foam at the mouth and it was really demonic. And then when he would come out of it, he would claim to have had these visions. 
One of them said that he could have a bunch of wives and concubines, and that would include a nine-year-old little girl named Aisha. And so he consummated with a nine-year-old little girl. That is just tip of the iceberg of what's been going on in Islam. Islam is a sex cult. You won't hear this on the news, no. <laughs> but I'm telling you it's true. Um, Islam takes its women in, under Sharia law and they mutilate the women. It's uh, called uh, female genital mutilation. It's, they call it circumcision, but it's just mutilation of the female. And they do that because they've got this really warped idea that women are about equal to dogs and they only have sex to have kids with the women. But for fun, they practice this thing called uh, pederity. Um, or pederity. Is it pederacy? Pederasty. Yeah, said it right. Pederasty. It's basically pedophilia. But what it is is they get a young boy and they treat him like they would a wife. And that's where they have their fun. That is normal in Sharia law Islam countries. You won't get that on NBC, ABC, CBS, CNN. It's a fact. And when they conquer other countries in war, I'm going to tell you something. If we're ever attacked by Islam and they conquer us, I'm taking my own life. They are not taking me prisoner because of what they do to the prisoners. Sex. And it's a thing of conquer. It's a thing of dominion. It all goes back to Muhammad, the, the founder. He started all this. Um, Joseph Smith, the Mormons, we're probably going to see a Mormon president. Uh, the Mormons were started by Joseph Smith, who was a sex pervert. And he wanted to have his own religion so he could have his own women. And so he started his religion, wrote this fictional book called the Book of Mormon, and started having visions and everything about being able to have more wives. And he picked a 12-year-old little girl and consummated marriage with her. And... Uh, had multiple wives. Brigham Young did the same. By the way, if you think Mormonism doesn't practice polygamy, just go out to Arizona, go out to Utah, go overseas, especially where Mormonism is taken over. It's still going on. They just don't record the marriages with the civil government. They have their... And, of course, you're seeing some of this on Life Channel and some of these TV stations are just openly showing it. Because it's a sex cult. Mormonism, their idea of heaven is a man gets his own planet, has a billion wives, has sex for eternity, and populates his planet. That's Mormonism. It's a sex cult. David Koresh. He actually was a good Seventh-day Adventist to start with, which I'm not saying that's good, but <laughs> I mean, that's not a sex cult. <laughs> but then next thing you know, he wanted to have women. So he started his own little Branch Davidian cult in wherein he was to have sex with all the women. If you had a wife and you were in the cult, you no longer were to be with her. And he got all the women. Over and over, Jim Jones, uh, you know, just read up on that. There's documentaries on it. Yeah, how many of you have heard of David Berg's mm -hmm. uh, The Family or The Family of God cult? And they were flat out pedophilia. I mean, they just, all the kids were abused. And that David Berg claimed to be getting these visions. Uh, and uh, we have the tens of thousands of 20th century victims of Rome's celibate priesthood. To forbid men to marry the way the Roman Catholic Church does, the Bible says, is a doctrine of devils. So what's the result? You have a bunch of men sodomizing little boys by the tens of thousands. And they love to point at some other religion and say, well, it happens there too. Yeah, like... 10,000 to 1. You're always going to have sin, but not to this extreme. So that's what's going on in the cults. Just like Jezebel. Teaching them to fornicate. It's connected with all false religion. I won't go through every one of these, but this is just a sampling. All about sex. Fornication. Uh, the sons of God and the daughters of men back in Genesis. It was all about uh, sex and procreation and, the, and the, uh, Satan's attempt to destroy the, the bloodline, the gene, the gene pool. The curse of Canaan. Whether or not it was actual a sex act or not, it was sexual in nature. And Ham was uncovering the nakedness of Noah 
And that's why, if you read that, try to explain to me why Noah cursed the descendants of Canaan, Ham's oldest son, if it wasn't something more than him just looking on Noah. There was more to it than that. And I'll leave it at that. Sodom and Gomorrah. It's re very interesting. Some of you probably read that over and over and you may not have noticed something because I thought everybody was noticing it. <laughs> and I've mentioned it a few times in the last few months and everybody looks at me and says, I never read that before. Uh, turn there in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 19. Genesis 19, and we're looking for the verse where they're surrounding Lot's house. Oh, verse 5. Verse 5. Okay. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. They want to rape these men, which were angels, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, verse 6. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. That's disgusting and everything, but let's keep reading. It says in verse 9, And they said, Stand back. And, oh, you know what? I want to stop there. Go back up to verse 2. Same chapter. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. Lot knew they did not want to stay in the streets of Sodom. And he said, He pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and he entered into his house, and he made uh, them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now look at this, verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, watch this, both old and young. Look closely at that. All the people from every quarter. It is the testimony of other writers of antiquity that they raped their children it was a pedophilia cult Sodom was uh, and I'm I'm just gonna leave it with this by saying that if you will research it and you read historical accounts of homosexuality they make no difference between having sex with children and normal homosexual sexuality until in the last 30 years Check me out on it. I, I, I've never had anybody be able to correct that statement. I've read for 20 years of this. And throughout history, if you read the Greeks, you read the Thracians, you read the Persians, you read any ancient or modern account of homosexuality involved older men with young boys. That is all the time we have for part one of our two-part study of the church at Thyatira, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. Be sure to listen to or watch part 2, which will be available on our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com. You may get in touch with us by clicking the Contact Us button at kjvbiblebelievers.com, or you can write to us at Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. That address again is P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. We hope that you will continue to study God's infallible book with us and that you will tell others about these Bible studies. I am Pastor Greg, and I thank you for listening.